In this video, I'm going to show you how to program a real quantum computer. To do this, I'll first talk briefly about the Deutsch algorithm. This is a toy problem and the simplest case of the deutsch josa or DJ algorithm. The DJ algorithm is what we'll actually code in this video. For a deeper dive on the Deutsch algorithm, check out my previous video, How to Code a Quantum Computer, where I actually talk more deeply through the math of how the algorithm works. Then, I'll talk about computational complexity theory, which is the way that we think about how long a computation will take. Next, after explaining how the deutsch josa algorithm works, I'll code it on an IBM quantum computer, and run it using a test case to show that it works. In both the Deutsch and the deutsch josa algorithms, we want to decide whether a random function that we're given is either constant or balanced. A balanced function returns zero half the time and one half the time, but how it does this doesn't matter. A constant function returns zero every time or one every time. For example, the simplest constant function that you could think of is f of x equals zero times x. For any value of x, we get that the output of this function is just zero. If we were to solve the Deutsch problem in a classical computer, it would take us two operations of the function to tell us whether the function is constant or balanced. This is because we'd have to evaluate both f of 0 and f of 1. If we do this problem on a quantum computer, however, the Deutsch algorithm lets us get away with only running the function once. By using the Deutsch algorithm, we can create an equal superposition of all the possible states of our quantum computer, and then run our function on them. If the Deutsch algorithm outputs a 0, the function is constant, and if the algorithm outputs 1, the function is balanced. This is very helpful, as it gives us a factor of 2 speedup. In the classical case, we have to run the function 2 times, whereas in the quantum case, we only have to run it once. That said, there's a small catch. You see, there's this pesky thing about quantum mechanics, which is that it's probabilistic. When we measure a quantum superposition state, we will measure one of the possible states of our system, meaning either 0 or 1. We don't measure anything in between. But what controls the state that we measure is the coefficients in front of the numbers in the superposition. This means that unless your algorithm perfectly puts you into a state that is only 0 or only 1, you will have some probability to measure the wrong answer. Since quantum computers are noisy, the Deutsch algorithm doesn't give you perfectly only 0 or only 1 states. So the real wave function of the output of the Deutsch algorithm run for a constant function might look something like this, which would give us a 99% chance that we measure the right answer, 0, and a 1% chance of measuring the wrong answer, 1. This seems bad, because a 1% chance of measuring the wrong answer could be a really bad thing in some scenarios, but we can correct for this by running our quantum computer many times. This will let us build up a probability distribution. If every time we get a wave function that looks like this, then after a thousand runs, we would expect 990 zeros and 10 ones. But this seems to completely defeat the point, right? I just told you before that the classical case takes two runs of the function, but now I'm telling you that the quantum case, which I said was better, would actually take a thousand runs? Spoiler alert, the quantum case is still better. Here's why. The Deutsch algorithm is boring. It's a toy problem and it's useless. But most of all, it's small. The Deutsch algorithm only uses two qubits, and it's trivial to do this on a classical computer. Sure, it's nice to have to run the function one time instead of two, but who cares about running a function twice? That takes less time than it probably took you to click the like and subscribe buttons. But seriously, the main problem with the Deutsch algorithm is that it's too small to see this large quantum speedup that we talk about. To see a speedup, we have to go to a problem with more qubits. The deutsch josa algorithm is the exact same thing as the Deutsch algorithm, only instead of for being for two qubits, it's for n qubits. This means that I can have as many qubits as I want in my algorithm, and the algorithm still works the same. Now, we're trying to see if a function on n bits is constant or balanced. Let's start by doing the same kind of analysis that we did before for the Deutsch algorithm case. We can first ask how long it would take a classical computer to solve this problem. We already know that for the n equals 1 case, we need two operations of our function from the Deutsch algorithm. But what about like n equals 3, for example? If n equals 3, then we have 2 to the 3, or 8 different possible combinations of bits. These would correspond to the binary representations of the decimal numbers 0 through 7. In the worst case, we could have a scenario where f of 0 equals f of 1 equals f of 2 equals f of 3. So the function looks like it's constant, but then f of 4 is not actually equal. So it's actually a balanced function. Therefore, we need to do five function calls in this case. 
and this could keep going on and on. As we increase n, the number of bits, the number of operations also increases. Specifically, the number of operations k increases by this formula. This is what we call the worst case computational complexity of the algorithm, meaning this is the worst case scenario. So after you do this many evaluations, you know for a fact that you're right. Usually, because n can get really large, we talk about complexity in more hand-wavy terms, dropping everything except the explicit dependence on n. To show people that we have done this, we use big O notation. So we would say k, the number of operations, goes like O, or is on the order of, 2 to the n for the classical solution. This means that for a function that takes n input bits, we would have to run our function about 2 to the n times in the worst case to tell whether it's a constant or balanced function. But this is really bad. For small n, sure, this doesn't matter. We could do the n equals 2, n equals 3, and even n equals 10 case on a classical computer pretty easily. But what about n equals 1,000? 100,000? A million? These numbers get huge fast, because the growth is exponential. Okay, so we see the problem here, but what about on our noisy quantum computer? It turns out that we only have to run the algorithm once, and then repeat it a thousand times for averaging. Since the deutsch joza algorithm works the same as the Deutsch algorithm, the function execution also works the same. That is, we only have to implement the function once. Now, don't worry, I'll go over the deutsch joza algorithm in a bit, but first I want to talk a little bit more about how cool this is. Like I said, when the number of input bits is small, the classical solution is way better. We only have to run the function a couple times, but we get our answer out very quickly. Whereas our noisy quantum computer needs a thousand runs for averages. But as n starts to increase, we see that the classical solution rapidly closes in on the quantum solution, which just stays in the same place, and before long you can't even see the quantum solution, because the classical solution takes so long. This exponential quantum speedup is a major reason why so many people are excited about the potential of quantum computers. Alright, so for the deutsch joza algorithm, we start with a register of n plus 1 qubits. We first initialize all of our n qubits to the zero state, and then on the n plus 1th qubit, we apply a NOT gate. We then apply a Hadamard gate to each qubit in the register. Just like the Deutsch algorithm, this puts us into an equal superposition of all possible answers. We can write this state using some fancy math notation, which looks complicated, but it's useful to represent states with lots of qubits, so we don't have to write a superposition with 2 to the n terms. I'll write out the first couple terms just so we can see what it looks like, but for the rest of the time here, I'll be using the summation notation. Now, we can apply the function f. This function maps our state to a new superposition which can be represented in the same notation as follows. After applying the Hadamard gates in the function, we have this complicated superposition written as a sum. So let's break this down. The 2 to the n minus 1 comes from the fact that for n qubits, there are 2 to the n different possible combinations. If we assign a number x to that state, we will count up to the number 2 to the n minus 1. Minus 1 comes from the fact that we start counting at 0, not 1. The 0 plus f of x and 1 plus f of x terms then simplify into the following equation. Remember, it was mod 2, so that's why we get this. The reason the math works like this is the same reason that in the previous video, when we did the casework, we got something similar, except without this whole summation. Namely, what happens is that if the function outputs 0, meaning f of x equals 0, then we get 0 minus 1 inside the parentheses. If the function outputs 1, meaning f of x equals 1, then we get 1 minus 0 in the brackets. Since 0 minus 1 is just negative 1 times 1 minus 0, we can represent this property by just multiplying the state, 0 minus 1, by a factor of negative 1 to the power of f of x, which, if you pause to check the math, does the same thing. Okay, but now we have this complicated math equation, how does this actually help us? Well, the next thing that we do is implement another Hadamard transform on all of the qubits except the last one. Now here, a quick aside. I'm going to show what happens if I apply a Hadamard transform to a general state that I'm going to call k. This time is different from the first time I applied the Hadamard gate, because this time, we don't know the inputs. Last time, we knew that all of the inputs were just a bunch of zeros and 1, 1. But this time, we have to work a bit harder, since we've applied our function already and we don't know the inputs. If I apply a Hadamard transform to a random state k, I get the following result. Now, if I apply this formula, but substitute in our state that our quantum computer is in after applying the function from before, I get this. So this state looks pretty complicated, but it's actually the final state before we measure. Remember, measuring a quantum computer collapses it, 
so we only measure one of the possible outcomes. Also, the values that we actually measure are determined probabilistically. The bigger the coefficient of state k, the more likely it is. For some general state in our quantum computer, we get the following probability of measuring it as the answer. So, for example, if n equals 3 and k equals 0, 1, 0, the probability that we measure our state is given by the following. Since we sum over x, this sum will contain 8 terms, with x being 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on. Now, having done that example case and getting a feel for how it actually works, let's go back to the algorithm. When we measure the state, we have two cases. We either measure the state of all zeros, or we measure anything else. Plugging in for the probability of measuring the all zero state gives us this sum. Here, if f is constant, and it doesn't matter whether it's constant at zero or constant at one, the expression tells us that the probability of measuring the state of all zeros will be equal to one. This means that if our function is constant, we are guaranteed to measure this answer 100% of the time, since a probability of 1 means 100%. On the other hand, if our function is balanced, then we can recalculate the probability of measuring the all-zero state. When we do this, we find that there is a perfect destructive interference, and the probability vanishes to zero. This means that if the function is balanced, we will measure some state other than the all-zero state. Okay, great. So now, all we have to do is code these math steps on a quantum computer. If the state that we measure at the end is the all-zero state, then our function was constant. But if the state that we measure at the end is something else, then our function was balanced. Okay, so now that we've been through the deutsch joza algorithm, let's code it up. While I don't have a quantum computer in my apartment, luckily that's not much of an issue. Coding quantum computers works through the cloud. We first go to Google Colab, which is an online coding platform run by Google, and open a notebook. In this notebook, we can import Qiskit, which is IBM's quantum coding library. For me to actually use IBM's quantum computers, I'm going to also need something called an API key, which I'm not going to show you. After getting the environment set up, we can start coding the algorithm. First, I'm going to write some code that selects a function that will actually pass to the algorithm that we're trying to tell whether is constant or balanced. Next, I'm going to write some code that initializes our algorithm. We need a qubit register, or a list of qubits to operate on, and a quantum circuit so that we can implement gates on our quantum register. We also need a classical register, which is a list of classical bits. When we measure our qubits, we will store the value that each qubit takes on, either 0 or 1, in a classical bit. Okay, so let's start implementing our actual algorithm. The first step is to apply a NOT gate to our last qubit, so that's in the 1 state. Then we'll apply Hadamard gates to all of our qubits. Remember, this is the step that puts us into a superposition of all possible answers. Now that we've applied our Hadamard gate, it's time to apply our mystery function. So we operate this function on our register of qubits. After operating the function on our register of qubits, we use another set of Hadamard gates again, following the algorithm that I laid out before. Finally, we measure our qubits, recording the value that the qubits take, and writing them to our classical register. We then run this for a thousand shots, and plot the results on a histogram, where on the horizontal axis we have all of the possible states that our quantum computer could be in, that is, all 2 to the n combinations, and on the vertical axis we have the probability of measurement, basically how many times we measured that state divided by a thousand the number of shots. Now remember, for a constant function, we expect the algorithm to output only the zero state. For a balanced function, we expect the algorithm to output anything but the zero state. Now first we're going to run our algorithm on the quantum simulator, and we'll see exactly that. Now this quantum simulator simulates a quantum computer using a classical computer, so it can only be so big. In this case, the quantum simulator can only simulate up to 23 qubits before it starts taking too long and actually stops you. But anyways, if we run our algorithm on the quantum simulator, we see exactly that. Now remember, this is just a simulator, so the results look perfect. This simulator doesn't have any noise. 
Now, we can change the backend using these commands here, and run the algorithm again. Only this time, we're going to run it on an actual IBM quantum computer. Here, I chose IBM Brisbane, which is one of their quantum computers that is open to the public for general cloud usage. It has 127 qubits. If we run the algorithm again, but this time on the actual quantum computer, we can still see that our correct answer is pretty likely. However, it's not 100% perfect like the case before. This is because today's quantum computers are noisy, and small fluctuations in the environment results in errors that propagate all the way through the calculations. Much of the hardware research that goes on today with regard to quantum computers is aimed at bringing down the error rates of these qubits to improve performances of algorithms like this one. The noise is the major current problem in quantum computing that's stopping us from scaling up our quantum computers to have so many qubits. Adding more qubits to a chip causes more random interactions between different qubits that we don't want, which further makes the noise problem worse. Until next time, I've been Lucas, this has been Lucas's lab, and thanks for watching.